Well, welcome to the uh, first webinar of 2013. And I'm delighted to introduce a new speaker to the DFO webinar series. Bally Ark is an accountant and he's going to deliver what has turned out to be the most popular subject in terms of registration so far, uh, which is uh, about tax planning. This webinar is being recorded and will be available online afterwards. So if anything is unclear, you can watch this again or any of the others in the series and forward the link to anyone else you think may benefit. So, Bally, over to you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining in on the uh, uh, webinar on managing the tax liabilities. My name is Bally Ark. I'm a chartered accountant and also a chartered tax advisor. I'm the principal at Accountants for Dentists, which provides specialist tax and accountancy advice exclusively to dentists. Um, Accounts for Dentists is uh, part of the Four Dentists Group, a national professional services organization that encompasses all independent uh, financial advisors, legal, practice acquisitions, and careers. I've been advising small and medium-sized owner-managed businesses since 1990 and uh, have a particular expertise in acting for dentists. So, just to kick off with the basics, the uh, structure of uh, the seminar today is going to be geared towards looking at some of the problems that uh, are raised with uh, the uh, tax liabilities that can, can be uh, put in front of uh, taxpayers come 31st of January and 31st of July. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to explore some uh, potential solutions, different scenarios as to how we can manage or how we can uh, mitigate or defer some of these tax liabilities. So let's just get back uh, to some of the basics before we de dive into some of the technical uh, areas. Now today we're going to be looking at um, the taxation of individuals, sole traders and partnerships, not necessarily limited companies. Uh, the tax year generally runs from the 6th of April to the 5th of April, and um, I'm not quite sure why it runs to the 5th of April, but uh, I do understand that it has something to do with the, the switch from the, the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar, um, uh, combined with a, a, an odd leap year back in the year 1600, but uh, the, the, the historical reasons are, uh, are, are have stayed with us uh, to this day. Um, now. We all have different uh, streams of income, and uh, they're all taxed uh, in, in a different way. So in, some income can be taxed uh, on an arising basis. Uh, other income can be uh, taxed on a received basis. And uh, finally, there's uh, income that can be taxed on a remittance basis, uh, but that is quite a specialist area and uh, only really relates to overseas income. But uh, we'll touch on that briefly uh, on the next slide or two. So. When we're talking about income that's taxed on a received basis, we're talking about uh, income that we actually physically receive in our bank or in our hands. So really that's limited to only two types of income and that's uh, bank interest and uh, dividends. So whilst your bank account may have accrued interest over a full calendar year, you may not actually physically get that um, interest until perhaps every six months or once a year. And it's only at the point that you receive the interest uh, that uh, that income becomes taxable. The same rule applies to dividends. Then we've got income that's taxed on an arising basis or often referred to as an earned basis. So uh, this type of income becomes taxable when it's generated or, or when the work's been done. So rather than looking at when the income has uh, been received, it's taxed on the basis of when has it been earned. Now, you may well trigger a tax liability because you've earned the income uh, and you may not necessarily have received it, uh, but it still becomes taxable because it's taxed on an arising basis. Now, um, if you're in practice, then uh, the likelihood is that uh, you'll prepare a set of accounts to an accounting year-end. Now, that year-end may not necessarily finish on the 5th of April. It could be you, you may prepare your accounts to the 30th 
of June or 31st of December. But um, what, whatever your accounting year end is, uh, it's the accounting year end that finishes within the tax year um, that uh, that becomes taxable for that tax year. And we will explore uh, some of the, the nuances of uh, different year ends um, later on. Uh, other income that's taxed on an arising basis are, are capital gains. Now, um, uh, very often we see practices that are uh, sold and the, the tax point for the sale is, is the date of completion. Now, the vendor may not necessarily receive his funds until um, a year or two down the line where payments are being staged, but uh, the, the sale becomes taxable on the date of completion, so that's taxed on an arising basis. And, other types of income that we see that's taxed on an arising basis are rental income, employment income, um, benefits in kind if you're an employee, foreign income, patent and royalty income, and also pension. So again, all of these uh, streams of income are all taxed on an arising basis, not necessarily when you receive the, uh, the income. Now, just touching briefly on uh, taxation, or, uh, taxation on a remittance basis, this is uh, generally UK taxpayers are taxable on their worldwide income, uh, either on an arising basis or on a received basis. Now, there is a, a particular technical um, area where income can be taxed, overseas income can be taxed on a remittance basis. And that generally applies to taxpayers whose father is born outside the UK. Um, and the taxpayer may well be classed as non-UK domiciles, even though they're resident and live on a day-to-day -day basis um, in the UK. The first, where, where taxpayers are classed as non-UK domiciles, the first £2,000 of overseas income is uh, completely tax-free. So if you're a 50% 50, 50 taxpayer and you've got a couple of thousand pounds worth of uh, bank interest, for instance, well, why not think about um, uh, using overseas bank accounts uh, and generating the interest uh, overseas, uh, and uh, the first two thousand pounds of that income is uh, is tax free. But again, this this only applies to uh, non-domiciled individuals. Again, any overseas income that's uh, generated, uh, that's remitted back to the UK to invest in a UK business, again, that's tax free. Uh, and finally, if you do have substantial overseas gains or uh, income, uh, you can elect to pay a fixed remittance charge of £50,000 per annum. But as I said, uh, this particular area is quite specialist and wouldn't necessarily apply to uh, uh, all the U all UK taxpayers. So before we get into some of the technical uh, nitty-gritty, it's worth just exploring uh, the different rates of taxes that uh, we are faced with and uh, some of the allowances that we, we have available to us. We're currently in the uh, tax year 2012-2013, so that's the tax year ended 5th of April 2013. Uh, at the top line you can see we, get, we all get a tax-free personal allowance of £8,105, uh, so any income up to that uh, level is received free of tax. That personal allowance increases to 9,440 uh, in the year 2013-14. Any income above 8,105, uh, the first 34,370, as you can see there, is taxed at 20%. Uh, the next uh, tranche of income up to 150,000 pounds is taxed at 40%, and over 150,000 is taxed at 50%. So what we can see here is that um, whilst next year the personal allowance has been increased by £1,335, the rate at which higher tax is triggered has been reduced. So. There's been some changes in the tax rates there, which will generally benefit the basic rate taxpayers. If you're a 40% uh, taxpayer, the overall tax liability has increased by £472. Now, if your income starts drifting above £100,000, you may be aware that 
this personal allowance starts to be taken away from you. So for every two pounds of income above 100,000 pounds, you begin to lose one pound of your personal allowance, giving you an effective tax rate of 62%. Now, we mustn't overlook the effect of national insurance, and we often talk about basic rates of tax being 20%. Well, actually, when you bring into account the national insurance 9%, you need to remember that the rate of tax is more like 29% rather than 20%, and 42% uh, or 52% at uh, uh, over 41,000 pounds. So that's, that's one to remember. Now, interestingly, and this is uh, something that's going to catch the eye of many dentists, uh, is the drop in the top rate of income tax from 50% to 45% in the 2013-14 tax year. So uh, where we have taxpayers or clients that um, are over the £150,000 income bracket, uh, there will be some tax to be saved um, by deferring or uh, pushing profits into the following tax year and paying tax at 45% rather than the current rate of 50%. And what I hope to do is uh, to show you some techniques of how to do that in the next few slides. Okay, so let's just kick off with a very basic example. Uh, we're looking at uh, the year ended 5th of April 2012. Let's assume we've got uh, bank interest of £1,500 received dividends from uh, a limited company of £30,000, and we've got uh, income generated from our practice of £130,000. Uh, noting the year end there is 30th of June 2011, it still falls within our 2012 uh, tax year. Okay, so the ta total taxable income for 2011-12 is £131,500. Um, the total tax liability would therefore be £45,197 for that year. Now, that isn't necessarily the amount of tax that you will pay in one go, and the next slide we'll be looking at how that liability is settled. And in order to do that, we need to go back one year to see what the tax liability was in 2010-2011. Now, assuming that the liability for the previous tax year was £30,000, what we would have to do is we would have made a payment on account on the 31st of January, that's in year 2011-12, based on 50% of the tax due for the previous year. So we would have paid £15,000 on the 31st of January 12. We'd have paid another payment on account on the 31st of July 2012, again 50% of the previous year's tax liability, and we would make a balancing payment at the end of this month of £15,197, which brings our total tax paid to £45,197. Now, it doesn't necessarily end there. It doesn't mean that our final payment in January 13 is going to be this 15,000 pounds here. What we need to take into account, and this is where a lot of um, our clients trip over, is the payment on account for the following year is based on the 2011-12 tax liability. So it's assumed that the liability for 2012 13 will be the same as 2011-12 uh, tax year. So not only do we make a payment on account of £15,000, we also make a payment on account of £22,000 for the following tax year, bringing our January payment to 37000 and again, a further payment on account in July at the bottom there of 22598 which is half of the 2012 tax liability. So, how are we going to manage this payment of 37,795? Well, one of the options is to reduce this payment on account towards the following year. Well, how are we going to do that? 
that's something we'll be looking at very shortly. The other solutions include reducing the profits. We'll be looking at whether we can defer any income or uh, bring costs forward. We need to make sure that we're maximizing all of the allowances available to us and all of the reliefs available to us and wherever possible where we've got spouses, civil partners that are paying tax at the basic rate bands, we need to make sure that we're utilizing those basic rate bands to the full. Incorporation. If you're trading as a sole trader or a limited company, then uh, incorporation is one of the angles that uh, we need to be looking at. And finally, we're seeing many, many, uh, uh, certainly particularly uh, private dentists uh, who have uh, set up uh, new practices or have invested substantially in their buildings who simply can't pay. Uh, so we'll look at some of the uh, solutions there. Right, so can we reduce the payment on account? Uh, now, 22,000 was the payment on account for the 30th of June 2012. Now, that payment will be made on the basis that the profits for the 30th of June 2012 are going to be the same, if not more, than the profits for the previous year. Now, if we know or if we think that the profits, now remember, we're pay, the payment on account is uh, 31st of January 2013. Um, we should by now know what kind of a year we've had in the 30th of June 2012. Now, if we know that uh, we've had a pretty slow year or the profits have been lower, then we can uh, make an application to reduce the payments on account for the following year. Um, the name of the game really is to make sure that uh, you're preparing your accounts uh, quickly, uh, soon after the year end, or at least you're preparing management accounts so that you know what your uh, profits are trending at uh, and if you are able to reduce or adjust your payments on account then that's something that you, you really need to um, uh, be doing quite actively and really taking the uh, this payment on account uh, by the horns and if you know that uh, your profits are falling then uh, then you know you should have a good uh, good reason to reduce those payments on account uh, obviously if your profits are consistent or if you're on an NHS contract um, and the contract value is the same, there's no major change in the overheads, then really there shouldn't be um, a reason for you to reduce those payments on account. Okay, um, well, what about reducing our profit? Well, that will certainly mean us paying less tax, uh, but there's the age-old saying of not letting the tax tail wag the commercial dog. Well, we don't want to start reducing our income just so that we can um, pay less tax, that's a, a ludicrous solution, but there are ways of reducing our taxable profits. How do we do that? Well, we can defer our income, we can make sure that we're claiming all of our costs, and we can bring some costs forward. So, you know, if, you're, if your year end is the 30th of June 2012, um, 2011 even, we can you know, take a look at the kind of uh, treatments that you might be undertaking towards the year end uh, and if anything can be pushed back a week or so into the following tax year or accounting period then that gives you an extra 12 months uh, of grace within which to pay your tax. You might be thinking of taking a holiday um, for the last two weeks or well, the first two weeks of an accounting period. Well, you know, Take, take the two weeks holiday in the, the last two weeks of the accounting period and uh, reduce the income or at least push the income back by a tax year there. Um, also worth looking at the type of income stream. So if you've got money um, being generated from bank interest um, and other forms of investment income, make sure you explore all the uh, tax-free routes um, such as you know, individual savings accounts, roll-up funds, as such, uh, to make sure that uh, you, know, you are maximizing your tax-free income streams. And uh, uh, our sister company, Money for Dentists, are ideally placed to, uh, to advise you on uh, those forms of investments. Bring forward 
or capture all costs. Now, um, capturing all costs is is, is quite key um, if you're if you're uh, making payments that are business related. Remember, it's only expenses that are wholly and exclusively for the purpose of the business uh, that are tax deductible. But uh, we do have um, a, a small brochure which uh, is used by a lot of dentists, which uh, we would be happy to. Uh, I'm happy to email across to you. Uh, you'll have my email address at the end of the presentation, uh, and that's got a, a fairly comprehensive list of the types of tax deductible expenses that uh, you can be putting through your accounts. Um, uh, assuming that we are capturing all of our expenses, let's look at bringing some of the larger items of expenses forward. So if, if you are uh, planning big um, uh, expense programs or uh, bonuses, or et cetera, et cetera, then look at the timing of those. Is it, it, it far better to bring those forward by a month if they're going to fall into the, the, the current tax year? Uh, that way you're getting your tax benefit early um, and it gives you, again, 12 months. So check that you're receiving a deduction for all of your business related costs and make sure that uh, you do speak to your accountant uh, uh, to check if you're not sure. Now we need to make sure that uh, we're using all of our tax deductible allowances also. So obviously everybody gets the uh, tax free personal allowance. Um, you may or may not be aware of the annual investment allowance that uh, applies where you're spending money on plant and machinery. Now, um, up to the 31st of December uh, 2012, the first £25,000 was 100% tax deductible, uh, beyond which uh, you received an 18% tax deduction for any capital expenditure. Now, that limit has been increased to £250,000 from the first, only for a two year period from the 1st of January 2013. Now, uh, so you may be tempted to uh, rush out and uh, that, that refit that you were thinking about, uh, you may be tempted to, to rush out and do that straight away, but uh, just uh, there are some technical hoops that we need to jump through in terms of the timing uh, of the spend especially where your accounting year end straddles the 31st of December. But again, uh, don't jump, just jump straight into the CapEx. Speak to your specialist uh, dental accountant about uh, your CapEx plans to make sure that you are maximizing uh, the full benefit of this £250,000. Very generous allowance. Um, alternatively, my email address will be at the end, so uh, please feel free to, uh, to email me. Okay, so we've touched on the annual investment allowance. Now, where you are or have made expenditure um, on plant and machinery or other kit, um, the standard rates of writing down are 18% uh, for normal plant and machinery. Um, where you are spending on uh, energy efficient equipment, do check that um, uh, it may be eligible, eligible for 100% um, enhanced capital allowances, um, which means that you get a 100% tax deduction uh, for energy efficient equipment. And now that does extend to motor vehicles. So if you are trading as a limited company, um, low CO2 emission cars uh, can qualify for a 100% tax deduction. So um, that's uh, quite a neat way of uh, getting yourself around town, as well as having a, a very tax efficient uh, motor vehicle to be driving around in. Business premises renovation allowances. Um, <coughs> surprisingly, it's, a, it's, it's one of those uh, very, very generous allowances that um, uh, still lots and lots of um, uh, dentists, uh, tax, other taxpayers, and, uh, and even accountants are still not aware of. Um, but if you are uh, looking at uh, acquiring another practice or uh, setting up another practice, um, the, if the building is situated in a qualifying postcode and it's been empty for 12 months, uh, if you're bringing it back into use, then 100% of the refurb costs 
um, of bringing it back into use are 100% tax deductible uh, against your income and they're also attached to the cost of the building so when you do eventually sell the freehold you get a tax deduction again so this is quite a generous allowance whereby you do get um, two tax deductions one against your income and another against the base cost of the building uh, when you do sell it uh, you do need to retain an interest in the building for seven years though so that's one to watch out for but again a very very generous allowance which uh, I think is, is is not used enough there are other um, allowances available if uh, uh, if, if you own uh, freehold properties, uh, you know, do do look at uh, getting a, a capital allowance specialist in to to do a survey of the building. I mean, you'll be surprised how many uh, hidden uh, items of plant and machinery there can be uh, within the building. Often within the structure and the fabric of the building, that can only really be identified by specialist um, capital allowances experts, who would then work with your accountant to uh, to identify the amount. Uh, that can be uh, available as uh, tax deductible may not have previously been claimed before. Okay, so we've got uh, the allowances. Uh, now let's look at some of the reliefs that are available to us. Um, there's the um, enterprise investment scheme, which uh, if you are you if you are spending money or investing uh, money in high, higher risk companies, it could be uh, companies that to actually list on the alternative investment market are often classed as enterprise investment scheme companies. <clears throat> they can trigger a 30% income tax rebate uh, or for investments up to a million pounds uh, and become tax free after three years. And uh, if you have already generated uh, capital gains in the previous 12 months, then uh, you're able to reinvest that money into an EIS company and uh, defer the gains. Uh, a new one that uh, was introduced in last year's budget from the 6th of April 2012 was uh, the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme which again a very very generous uh, tax relief. Um, it's available for small startup companies which are less than two years old but if you are investing up to a hundred thousand pounds you get a straight 50 percent tax rebate so on a hundred thousand pound investment if you paid fifty thousand pounds in tax uh, you would get a full refund of that fifty thousand pounds and for this year only this tax year only i.e. the year ending 5th of April 2013 there's also a, a capital gains tax exemption so if you have sold an asset or a property or a practice uh, and you've got gains of um, a hundred thousand pounds or over um, if they've been taxed at 28 percent then you can get a refund of the capital gains tax also so very very generous uh, relief there uh, and one which uh, should be used wherever possible entrepreneurs relief well <clears throat> it, this is one of my um, uh, favorite uh, tax rates uh, entrepreneurs relief uh, capital gains tax uh, at ten percent rather than the highest rate of income tax at fifty two percent now um, we have to ask ourselves well which one would we prefer to pay and uh, often the the answer will be well I'd prefer to pay the ten percent rather than the fifty two um, now what that means is uh, a complete rethink about uh, how you generate your income whether you generate it as income working nine to nine to five nine to seven um, or whether you build up your practice, sell it on, uh, pay tax at 10%, reinvest that money, roll it into a new practice, sell the practice, and carry on paying tax at 10%. Uh, now, you are allowed in your lifetime to generate 10 million pounds worth of capital gains, uh, which is all taxed at 10%. So, um, as I said, it does need a fundamental rethink about uh, how you uh, Rate and your strategic uh, business plan, but um, it can certainly add a fairly substantial amount to your bottom line, uh, well, at least 40%. And we've also got um, loss reliefs, which uh, again, if you've got other businesses outside of uh, dentistry or um, you've got hobbies which are turning into trades, uh, those can be uh, set off 
if you're losing money on those, those can be utilized and set off against your, um, your income streams from uh, dentistry. Um, but there, there, is, um, there are a, n a number of uh, kind of schemes, if you like, uh, out there which are designed to, uh, to uh, create losses. Um, but uh, certainly there's a clamp down um, within uh, recent budget statements and uh, certainly the December statement uh, where they've, uh, they'll be capping uh, the loss reliefs at uh, the greater of £50,000 to 25% of the income um, as opposed to giving you unlimited loss relief. But uh, again, uh, where you've got genuine losses, um, then uh, you know, make sure you, you, are, you are offsetting them uh, against your income. Uh, which could then help to bring the tax liabilities down. Now those are some fairly high level advanced uh, schemes there, but let's go back to some of the basics and you know we've got to make sure we're using our basic rate bands. Um, if you, if, as I said, if, you, if your wife or husband or partner uh, is on a, a lower level of income, then do consider transferring some investment income across to them and have them paying tax at 20%. Uh, rather than uh, 40 or 50 percent, and uh, certainly, uh, if your other half is is uh, working in the business or is certainly doing some administrative duties for you, then again, you know, do consider getting them on the payroll to save a good few percent um, uh, in tax. Uh, incorporation is probably uh, another webinar, I think. Um, it, it's uh, quite a complex and uh, uh, subject. Certainly, it's generally more tax efficient, especially with the highest rate of corporation tax coming down to 21%. It does certainly allow, um, uh, it certainly does allow you to, to control the level of tax that you pay. Uh, once you've paid the 21%, and it's generally based on how much you draw from the business. However, um, the, 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 the NHS, um, uh, the, there are a number of traps uh, for dentists and associates in particular um, who can lose their um, NHS pension allowances um, if they're not careful. So it does need uh, some very, very careful planning. Um, you know, if you are operating practice, uh, perhaps with the NHS um, and uh, private, um, it may you may want to look at just incorporating the private side. Certainly, a number of PCTs don't like to uh, be changing contracts or moving contracts around, and there's always a risk that uh, the contract value will be reduced as well. So, um, so it does need a lot of planning. Um, definitely, if you if uh, you're looking at incorporation, um, yes, there's the upsides of uh, you know some uh, fairly nifty tax savings to be had, uh, but I would definitely um, recommend a feasibility study to be undertaken. And again, if in doubt, you know, make sure you speak to your uh, specialist dental accountant. Finally, I'm seeing more and more uh, dentists, certainly uh, private dentists who are spending or have spent a substantial amount um, in setting up uh, new practices, investing in new equipment, refurbishing of buildings, properties, etc. And basically, you know, the income just hasn't come through. Uh, and there's a lot more um, of them who are now you know, facing some serious cash flow problems. And the income's just not there to pay the tax bill. The name of the game <clears throat> is not to bury your head in the sand, uh, because if you don't pay, if you try and avoid uh, payment, or if you try and avoid submitting your tax return, uh, there's some fairly hefty penalties and surcharges which uh, can come and nip you in the bud. So uh, if you are filing if you, your tax return late just to avoid paying the tax, uh, you're looking at an initial penalty of £100. And uh, from last year, uh, there's an, uh, an additional penalty of £10 a day for late submissions if it's three to six months late. And now there's a tax-geared penalty uh, if your uh, return is submitted more than six months late. Um, and we are seeing more and more of these penalties coming through, even for taxpayers who have no tax to pay. They may have had uh, uh, a notification to submit a tax return. Um, 
uh, overlooked it and uh, I've got stung with penalties up to £1,200, £1,500. Now we talked about reducing the uh, payments on account earlier. Uh, you do have to make uh, an educated um, uh, guess. There has to be a good reason for you to reduce those payments on account. You can't just uh, take a flyer and try and wing it uh, because there are penalties uh, for um, making false statements to reduce those payments on account. So you do genuinely have to have uh, uh, looked at the results uh, of your accounts for the following tax year before you make that decision to reduce the payments on account. So there's just a small word of warning there. Um, so if you have submitted your tax return on time, uh, but you haven't got the funds to pay, um, the kind of penalties that you need to be looking at, and this is off, can be a, a balancing act between um, p paying the tax man or paying other bills. Well, you know, you have 30 days grace for payment, uh, after which there's a 5% surcharge, um, which is about the level of bank borrowing, uh, but if it's uh, more than six months uh, late, that's the payment, then uh, there's another 5% uh, surcharge, which then becomes, starts to become expensive. Uh, and if it's more than 12 months late, that's the payment, uh, then it's 15%. Uh, Still quite expensive, but cheaper than um, uh, 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 racking up your credit card bills or paying off your credit card bills. But generally, as soon as the return goes in and HMRC uh, have identified that there is a liability, they will be on your case to, uh, to collect. Um, on top of the uh, surcharges, uh, there's interest due, which is 3%. Um, and quite interestingly, if you've overpaid your tax, you only uh, earn half a percent, which uh, is uh, ironic. But generally, if you're finding that you're struggling to pay the tax at the end of the month, you must speak to your accountant. But generally, keep HMRC informed so that they know what's, uh, what's going on. Try to make regular payments so that you can demonstrate a willingness to pay. Uh, it may mean that you have to put a statement of assets and liabilities together, but you can come to uh, payment arrangements with HMRC. Uh, and if you do come to a payment arrangement, then you do need to stick to it. Uh, otherwise, HMRC do have a tendency to get a little bit upset. Thanks very much, Bally. Uh, I, I think you did an excellent job there presenting a complicated subject in a way that was quite easily understandable. So, and I do have a couple of questions uh, for you from the audience, if that's okay. Um, sure. One is, uh, do you recommend using an accounting program to produce monthly management accounts, and if so, which one? And the other one is, uh, is there an advantage to your year end? I presume that means wh where you have your year end in, in relation to the financial accounting year end. Uh, and if so, when should you choose? Oh, right. Okay, good. Yeah, um, so I would definitely... Um, recommend using an accounting package. Uh, now there are a number of packages, Zero seems to be a, a very uh, uh, commonly used um, accounting package whereby um, uh, you know you are able to upload your bank statements uh, directly onto that, it's a monthly subscription, um, so that's, that's quite a, a useful accounting package, but I, I would definitely recommend um, any accounting package that uh, can do your, your dental as well as your financial and practice management uh, in, in one. Um, uh, what it does do is it allows you to to plan, manage on a real time basis. Uh, so if you are putting management, you know, getting your manage, monthly management accounts together uh, on a regular basis, then uh, you can certainly spot problems earlier, and you can plan things quicker. And um, also uh, helps you point uh, helps you spot which parts of your practice are profitable uh, if you make each. Uh, clinician a, a profit center or each surgery a profit center then uh, it helps you with uh, analyzing the profitability of course yeah yeah um, you know benchmarking you can do so much more when you've got uh, good uh, robust information systems in place um, in terms of the year end generally at the earlier in the year so we're talking 30th of April 31st of May uh, is the uh, best kind of best year end if you like um, especially if uh, you're starting out in practice now there are some quirky rules about um, uh, which periods are taxed when you first start out in practice 
and uh, without going into too much detail, the earlier in the year that your year end is, the, the better the cash flow um, when you're first starting out in practice uh, and the better planning uh, you can do in terms of the payments on account um, because you, you, by the time your payment on account has come round, you should have finished your um, 30th of April, 31st of April tax returns um, by the time uh, you, you know your January payment has come round. So the earlier in the tax year, the better. Now we've got one more that's just come through, uh, and then we, are, sure. we will be winding up before two o'clock. So uh, it says, uh, what are the main benefits of using a specialist accountant? By, by which I mean, I mean obviously it's nice that your accountant knows what PCT stands for, etc. There's a, a, a number of areas where it's so easy to, to trip over things, areas like superannuation. Uh, I mean, we work very closely with um, uh, dental financial financial advisors um, on establishing at what level of pension contributions to, that can be made. Um, the way the um, NHS and uh, uh, private um, income is generated and any tax planning that can be done around there in terms of um, the way the, the, the PCT approach, um, the, uh, it kind of where contracts are housed if you like. Um, there's also um, some fairly complex um, rules on if you are you know operating out of a limited company how, how the income um, uh, is, is drawn out of that business and therefore how much superannuation um, uh, is, is, uh, is applied. Um, so yes, there are some you know, fairly complex areas and you know, if, you, if you do get it wrong, um, you know, the, the penalties can be high. Um, and also there's the understanding of, uh, it's just understanding how different items are treated and uh, you know, when, if, you, if you've got a, an accountant that's acting for a number of dentists, um, you, you're very, uh, you, you're in an ideal position to start benchmarking across the board and if uh, you know, it looks like various expense categories are looking low or it's a percentage, they may be looking too high, it gives you, it gives you a, a better working knowledge of how practices operate. That's great. That uh, well, yes, yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bally. And uh, just to say, Bally's always happy to talk to Dental Fusion members and contributes to the Fusion magazine. So if you are a member, do get in touch with any other financial subjects, like Incorporation, which we've had, just had a question on. Um, we've also had a question on wh where it's advisable to practice, e e either in the UK or outside the UK tax-wise. I think that's a bit specialist, so we might get you to answer that yes. question uh, directly. Um, that's but, fine. Uh, if there are any other subjects like incorporation that you would like to see Bally cover in one of these webinars, then please do get in touch. Now, in the next webinar, Seema Sharma of Dentabyte is going to discuss how practice owners and managers can distribute workload across their teams by allocating roles and responsibilities. So. I look forward to talking to you all again, and thanks to Bally for his excellent talk, and to you for your time and attention. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.